Okay, so we had a brief of the Caritas Hospital, which is a busy hospital here. And with me is Deepak, who's going to do the case. Uh, Dr. Deepak. Christopher Rafael, who will be our imaging expert. And we have Sister Mary, Jojo, and Sister Anu, all with us, and a great team going to show us the case. So please go ahead, Deepak, with yeah. the case. Yeah, good evening to all of you. Uh, first of all, let me take this opportunity uh, to thank the organizers all the directors of IPCI and Roni sir for having given us this opportunity. Uh, well, uh, I should also immensely thank Ajit sir who has consented to be with us here today afternoon. I should also thank Dr. Chris from Australia who's come here as an amazing expert with us. Uh, without wasting much of time, I shall take you through the case as such. Uh, can, you, can you show us the fluoro monitor? Can you enlarge the fluoro monitor? Okay, well, this is a 70 year old gentleman who presented with an inferior wall myocardial infarction to a nearby hospital. He underwent thrombolytic therapy, continued to have angina, and was taken up for a rescue angioplasty. The right coronary artery was non dominant. This is the left coronary system. You could see that the circumflex is a dominant vessel, no much of lesion in the circumflex. The ramus or the early OM, it's a huge vessel, it's almost three millimeter in size. You could see that there is tight stenosis in the Ramus intermedius, uh, next front. You could also see in the cranial view that LED has got a long, diffuse, tight stenosis. In this view itself, you could also clearly see that there is a very critical ulcerated flap like lesion in the ramus intermediate. So that was a culprit. So we went ahead and evaluated that with OCT and stented it. Can you show the next, next front? Next front. You could see here that it's a early OM, it's a huge vessel with a critical stenosis. Next one. That's the RCA. Next one. It's non-dominant and has got intermediate stenosis. We wired the ramus intermedius and we had an OCT pullback from the vessel, which Dr. Chris is going to explain to you right now. We went ahead with stent implantation and we could achieve a reasonable flow. Show us the next images also and then we'll move on to Dr. Chris. That was a stent that was implanted. Next one, that's a 38 millimeter expedition. That's the stent being deployed. Next. And it was post dilated with a three millimeter balloon. Next one. That's a three millimeter post dilatation. And next. That's the, that's the final result that we could achieve. Dr. Chris will explain to you regarding the pre and post OCT run of this particular lesion. And then we'll move on to today's LED lesion. Now the background. Thanks, Deepak. Uh, I hope uh, orange, if, uh, orange, orange is the orange is the main background. Yeah. Please speak. Yeah, Chris, please. Yes, yes. You can see that. Um, so hopefully you've got the OCT up. Resume. Uh, you have a time there. And um, the we'll just focus really on given this is uh, I suppose the. Uh, uh, not the uh, not the vessel that we're going to be on today. Uh, this was an ACS, as you know, and uh, with a hazy lesion, uh, sort of in this mid segment. And in the long view, you can actually see there's something abnormal going on here with the cavity. So I'll just uh, let that run through. As you can see, there's a lot of eccentric plaque there, and pause it here. Here at this point, just before it comes to this area of interest here, you can see a, a real circumferential lipid-rich plaque. Uh, this is all lipid here, the typical uh, uh, 
uh, features of lipid very bright at the surface uh, and then attenuating as we go down and that's a, a very large lipid plaque the extent of which obviously we don't see because of the penetration depth with OCT. As we come a little bit more proximally you see what the problem is in this patient and uh, here's a little intraplaque cavity uh, within the necrotic lipid core and there's an area of disruption so this really was the cause of this uh, person's uh, ACS. Uh, going back more proximally, um, real fibrous plaque right through, uh, quite thick, with no real area of plaque-free vessel. Uh, heading right up uh, quite tight here, even near the ostium, and then we head back to the left main trifurcation. Um, so that was really what uh, the initial... Uh, uh, OCT was. We'll uh, now show you uh, pull back today uh, post PCI view of this vessel. Uh, just really demonstrating again, I'll take you through that um, manual in the interest of time. Um, looking first at the distal end, uh, a very nice distal end with no evidence of significant dissection there, uh, a nicely expanded stent. You can see uh, percentage expansion is 82%, uh, which I think is very reasonable. Um, the area of interest here is well covered with no tissue protrusion or intracent dissection. A small area of intracent dissection there. And as we come more proximally, the stent area of 5.7, 6. You can see a little dissection flap here, uh, intimal dissection, which in fact is totally covered uh, and the stent it covers the entire ostium of the ramus with just a few struts into the bifurcation, which shouldn't really cause any problem. So a well expanded stent, everything nicely covered. Can you, can you show the fluoro, fluoro monitor? Can you enlarge the fluoro monitor? So today's stent. Yeah. So uh, we have the LED lesion now, which you can see clearly in the cranial next. view, maybe the next view would next. be. Okay, so we interrogate the LED lesion. As you can see that the LED has a long lesion right from the proximal to the mid segment. You can see a yeah. bend and there's a lesion there and the concern for our OCT was whether the OCT will clear uh, with a uh, small predilatation or not. And so anyway, we took a picture with a two millimeter predilatation of the lesion to see what the OCT shows. Can you play the OCT and let Chris review the OCT now? Uh, Dr. Uh, Ajit, could, you, could we uh, go to the two short talks and then come back to you for half an hour? Yeah, sure. We can show you the OCT and then go to the you can, if you can give us two minutes, we'll show you the OCT and then go to your talk. Perfect. So this is, in fact, the first OCT without any predilatation, and part of the discussion on what the best imaging modality uh, is, maybe uh, uh, IVUS or HD IVUS, uh, given the distal stenosis might inhibit complete flushing. In fact, with the first run, uh, you can, in fact, see the distal landing zone although the clearing is not ideal it's good enough really to actually see that this is your distal landing zone where we would probably want to land the stent and in fact get a few measurements uh, uh, just to at least size the stent accepting that there's no predilatation uh, so this is probably slightly underfilled this area. So we're getting about uh, 2.4 about 2.4 media to media here, probably in a slightly under uh, dilated uh, uh, lesion. So even without predilatation, we're able to get good enough views to get uh, really an assessment of our distal reference diameter, which is around 2.5, we think. Um, We'll go back to the next one with a bit of pre, the two or pre dilatation, which in fact the distal end doesn't clear as well, but the rest of the lesion actually clears quite nicely. Um, now, this is a heavily uh, 
um, atherosclerotic vessel where there's no real normal vessel and that's a challenge obviously to get your measurements here circumferential plaque with a bit of calcium disruption with the two or balloon uh, again eccentric fibrotic plaque no real area of uh, vessel that's free of any plaque eccentric plaque with little islands of calcium although not heavily calcified so mainly fibrotic plaque and if there's any plates of calcium they're, they're quite thin and not circumferential and in fact the plaque extends all pretty much to the ostium of the LAD so we need to be quite careful both in our placements and not oversizing uh, uh, the vessel here and even with, with the eye of faith we're probably seeing you know 3.25 might be a good option in the proximal end okay so we have some preliminary information so you could go ahead with your lectures ronnie and get back to us when you're ready we'll make some further measurements of length and stuff and go ahead Please go. so we left you at uh, a pre post dilatation of two millimeter with the oct and now chris will tell you what we did after we dilated it with the two five in the pre and show you the pre-picture first and uh, then we will go to what we did. So Chris, can we read the pre-OCT after the dilatation? So we're just letting it load. Um, so you saw our initial pictures. And in fact, um, despite pre-dilating the lesion a bit more aggressively, the very distal end still didn't clear. And in fact, our first pullback was as good as any. And that's because very distal to this, we had a stenosis, which uh, we elected not to treat uh, because it was at a bend and it was in the distal LAD. And that does inhibit clear out of contrast. Uh, but it was really enough, as, we, as I said, to figure out where we wanted to land the stent, the size of the stent, which was 2.5 distally. And overall, we thought we would have to bring the stent back as close to the ostium as possible. And that was uh, really a stent length of close to 50 millimeters. So we would have to use two overlapping stents. In the proximal area of uh, near the ostium, as you can see, and, and this is uh, very important, I think, for people who are just starting imaging. Uh, in some patients, and I think particularly all the patients you see here in India, you almost never have a normal vessel. So all of these teachings you get saying, you know, do your EEL or lumen in the reference normal segments. Here you don't. So you have to use a bit of common sense. Uh, don't go straight to a protocol and say it's EEL and size it to the EEL, particularly if you have a positive remodeling and a lot of plaque, you'll end up significantly oversizing the stent. So here we got a measurement of about 3.25 millimeters and we elected to go distally with a 2.5 stent, proximally with the 3.0 stent as a starting point. The other thing we wanted to make, there was a big septal, so overlapping at the septal, so we thought we'll put our first stent just distal to the septal, and that came in with a, st with a stent length of about you know, uh, 28, first stent was 2528, and then our second stent overlap uh, was a 3-0 stent. Okay, thanks, Chris, uh, for that. Uh, and can we go on to the angiogram pictures now? So the decision was to use two stents because there was a mismatch on the diameters. This leaf is to five, and probably is getting three plus. Uh, it was more than fifty millimeters length, so you would use two stents. And the important thing was to use the stent distally, which would not land up with an overlap in that large septal. So we tended to use a uh, 25, 28 millimeter stent. Uh, it is a Zions Alpine, which we use for the distal. And uh, can we show that picture? So uh, Deepak, you can go ahead now. Yes. So it was uh, 
uh, as sir has mentioned it was uh, distally the landing zone was 2.5 so we went ahead with a 2.5 into 28 alpine that was positioned you could see that stent being positioned there next image well that's the position where we had the distal landing zone uh, we didn't want to have a overlap at the major septal branch so yeah, the, the length of the stent was taken in such a way that it lands beyond the major septal vessel. So that's the position where we positioned it. Next, uh, we deployed it at 14 atmospheres. Next, pulled the balloon back and went up, went, uh, went up at 16, 18 atmospheres. Next, then we measured the proximal stent length also. That came to around 28. It was something very close to the OCT derived length. Next. Then we went ahead with a 3 into uh, 28 alpine. Next, it was deployed at next. It was positioned right at the ostium of the left anti distilling artery. We, we evaluated in multiple views and next. So it was deployed at 14 atmospheres. Next. That's, uh, that's angiography following the both the stent deployment. Then we went ahead with post dilatation. Next. 2.75 distally and 3.25 proximally. 2.75 we went up to 20 atmospheres near the bent and distally we went up to 16 to 18 atmospheres. Next. 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 That's 2.75 post dilatation. Next. That's the 20 atmospheres at that bent. Next. At the overlap. Then we went ahead with 3.25 balloon proximally. Next. Again, at up to 20 atmospheres near the ostium. Next. So we went up to 20 atmospheres at the ostium. Next. 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 Then we took an OCT run of that particular uh, vessel after the stent deployment and post dilatation. Dr. Okay, Chris. so Chris will now help us to read the post deployment of two stents with an overlap 28 distal, 28 proximal, 25 distal, 30 uh, proximal, post dil 275 distal, 325 proximal, and this is the OCT picture after that. Chris, please read that. So, uh, this is it, as you can see on the bottom. It's a non rendered stent, which is important really to first look at. Uh, uh, your uh, stent, uh, distal and proximal ends. So we knock off the rendered stents. Uh, distally, really nice distal landing zone. No real major issues distally. Uh, as we come proximally again, it looks nice. Uniform expansion overall. No major tissue prolapse. A, a bit of dissection there, which as you'd expect in this uh, heavily atherosclerotic vessel. Uh, again, plumping up more proximally. Um, right up to the very proximal end. We, this is the left main as you're coming to the ostium of the LAD. So Deepak, actually it's perfect uh, landing of the stent at the ostium of the LAD. Uh, not something you see that often. There's a little bit of a, a not necessarily intimal tear or dissection, but a, a, a little bit of um, shaving off of the intima, which we sometimes we do see. It's really of no significance, uh, less than a quarter, not deep at all. And we would leave that. We next go to uh, the rendered stent, and that gives us a very nice idea just to look at. You can see this is where the overlap is, and just to make sure we haven't compromised that septal, there's that big septal here, and we've only got one layer of stent at the septum. The next thing, obviously, is expansion. So um, this is the distal part, distal half. Our expansion is about 75%. We want really to try and get to 80% or more if possible. And you can see here, uh, both on uh, the uh, view of, uh, with the red mark showing a bit of under expansion, and even in the long view that the stent here is probably slightly under expanded. So we can really try and plump that up and optimize it. We then check on uh, the proximal part of the stent, uh, just to look at how that is. Uh, and that's 87% expanded. So the proximal stent is really very good. So all we need to do here is touch up this segment and, and we should have a, a really very nicely expanded stent with uh, no significant uh, PCI related acute issues.
Thank you, Chris. So basically, we have a little bit of under expansion in the middle segment, just beyond the overlap segment. And so we elected to go with a 3 ohm millimeter balloon there at high pressure. So Deepak, please go ahead. Can you enlarge the fluoromonitor? Okay, so uh, that's the OCT run, which made us understand that in the mid portion of the stent, it was not, it was under expanded. So we went ahead with further dilatation. Next, we, next, we went with a three millimeter balloon. Distally, the stent was post dilated with 2.75 millimeter balloon at uh, uh, 20 atmospheres. So this time we took a three millimeter balloon and post dilated at 20 atmospheres. Next one, 20, 22 atmospheres. So that's the area where we further dilated it with a three millimeter balloon. Next. So went up to 22 atmospheres. Next. And then that's the final OCT run. Dr. Chris. So basically the only difference is when we looked at stent expansion, this was our area of interest that we hit a bit harder. Uh, expansion now is 85%, uh, which is really very reassuring. So I think we've you know, done what we wanted to. Um, I think this is a, a good example that uh, even in uh, vessels where you think OCT may not be the best imaging choice, and, and we can have a discussion about you know, IVIS versus OCT here, uh, even with OCD, we actually are able to get, you know, really good, adequate imaging and sizing, uh, and of course, post-tent deployment, uh, exceptional visualization. So basically, we got to uh, expansion of about 85% distally and about uh, close to a 90% proximally. So we'll open this to discussion, and uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of discussions of IVIS versus OCT, whether... 87% is okay as far as Illumin 4 is concerned, is 85% okay as far as Illumin 3 and 4 criteria are concerned? Do we need it better or uh, more? Dr. Matthewson, uh, what is your viewpoint on that? No, it is not on that. I'm very concerned about dealing a digital after 50, million, 50 millimeters of long stand, the proximal lady to the distal segment, and dealing another digital beyond that. I mean, it could be anecdotal. I had two experiences of dealing situations coming back with the acute stent thrombosis within a short period of time, within a week. And then thereafter, I became a little more cautious of dealing situations. I tend to treat that also because slow, slow flow produced by that lesion, would it be going to predispose the stent for thrombosis? Do we have an evidence that leaving those patients are free for the not treating, not, not treating it? Uh, Chris or any of you have got the answer, please. So we discussed that, Dr. Matthew. Uh, there were two issues. One, we had, uh, there was a lesion and there was a discussion, should we fix that and then do those CTs uh, anyway? The issue was uh, two things. One is it's at the bend. You can see how the lesion fulcrums at that bend is a two millimeter vessel. There are multiple small collaterals before it uh, and uh, septal, collaterals be uh, septal uh, vessels before it. So the issue was, are we going to put a two millimeter stent distally and stent at a bend, which is moving, you can see that very, very, it's moving and uh, look for a stent fracture versus the risk of stent thrombosis because we're leaving that alone in the presence of the septal collaterals. I think it's an important question maybe we can uh, discuss this out with the uh, with the uh, panel and maybe Chris what do you think yeah so yeah I completely agree that's always a concern and it's a sort of a risk benefit ratio as you mentioned uh, there is there are lots of collaterals good diagonals so there is plenty of outflow within that whole vessel so I think in some respects that's protected and the distal LED is very diminutive and, and uh, quite diseased as well. So it may not, I think, on balance, particularly since it's at, at a very um, uh, tortuous segment, which is highly mobile, the risk benefit probably is to leave it alone at this stage. And so certainly. Open this to the panel. What does the panel think about this? Let's discuss about the distal lesion. Would you uh, uh, leave that distal lesion, or would you uh, would you want to tackle that? Uh, 
Of course, we would like to limit the friction because the diameter has said that it is uh, around 2 millimeter or even less than that. And we, even if we, uh, we dilate it, we may end up in a resection which can compromise the distal flow. So it is better to leave the lesion, which uh, appears to be very stenotic, but still it's in the artery which is of less caliber, which is around 2 millimeter. So uh, I don't think there is any need to address that lesion. Good. I mean, the other point that we were talking about is uh, uh, about the expansion limits. Uh, would everybody want a 90% expansion as Don Illumin said or, or, or would an 80% expansion to win here despite the dilating with a 3 millimeter balloon where uh, they put a 2.5 stand, I think we still have not reached 90% expansion. That's again the viewpoint from the experts. We always don't need to do 90% addition or expansion in all the cases. I think we should be happy with the result and as we uh, perform push dilatation with zero balloon. The mid uh, part and the nice, it is nice. There's no need to get the 90% always. Yeah, I mean, a looming four, we were required to attempt to get to 90 in this was the second round of optimization. I think it's more than acceptable. It is two five stands, I agree. Um, so I think we're well over 80. Um, I, I think we also need to account for our NSAs as well. I think, um, you know, I think. Uh, and we're uh, pretty much throughout that fiscal stand segment, well over 4.5 in indexing it. Uh, I, I would have left it with the second round of optimization, and I would have left it with that fiscal distance. But it's well, well beyond if, uh, 10, 12 plus millimeters from the distal stand edge. It's not that we saw on the imaging, we didn't have a distal dissection. We had um, not a great amount of part, quite a good uh, lumen despite the, the disease. Distal distal edge, so within five millimeters. So I think that is within a short second of the stand, I would have fixed that region in the Right. Uh, we, uh, Dr. Chris, we can see a small dissection proximally. I know it doesn't fit the criteria for us to take action, but that's at the left me. How comfortable are you just ignoring that? Uh, I'd be very comfortable. It's it's uh, it's it's a, a very it's almost I suppose an intimal sliver, uh, which interestingly, if you do enough OCTs, you'll see with your guide catheters you get little intimal slivers that you leave behind. Uh, it's uh, not deep. Uh, it's tacked down by the stent, uh, and in addition, it's proximal. So I, I would be very happy to leave that alone. Uh, what would be a threshold for uh, tackling a dissection proximally at the left main? I'm not talking about a dissection just in the but a dissection at the left main. We didn't hear you clearly. We can't hear you very well. Uh, uh, Roy, uh, uh, Ronnie, can you speak a little onto the mic? Yeah. Right. No. See, we have the criteria when we should be tackling a dissection based on a CD. We got a, we got an angle, we got a, we got a distance, etc. But do this hold? Does this hold good when you are having a dissection in the left main? It's so what is your threshold to tackle a left main dissection? So basically, uh, as Chris said, uh, these sort of slivers, as what he said, or small dissections, are very commonly seen when you, even with a guiding catheter in the left main. Uh, Post procedure, when you do a Dustino CT follow up. You see this guiding without even a stent in the left main, just because of the guiding catheter movement. Uh, these are small dissections usually heal by themselves. You don't have to touch them. The other part is, is it is, I, there is a stent nicely in position there. I don't expect this to close anything. It's unlikely to propagate proximally. And I am, I'm, I'm pretty happy to leave that alone completely. I agree with completely with Chris that yes, the criteria for dissection certainly don't fill, but even if this is a proximal dissection, which is prior to the stand and in the left main, I would leave it alone. The panel points to talk with discussions. Just about the distal lesion, I was thinking that it's almost a time three and uh, it's curving around the apex and a significant amount of. Uh, 
just uh, what can harm I mean, if we violate that relation with the is there a consensus, Ronnie, that we need to fix that distal lesion with at least? I'm I'm clear that if you balloon this, this is going to be lining up with the stent because that's at the at the bend. You're not going to get a good lumen with just plain balloon dilatation, and we land up with a two to five short stent. Great. I have a vote here. Let's see. Um, all those who want to fix that lesion, can you raise your hands? I thank you. Uh, don't want to fix the lesion. Sorry? I don't want to fix the lesion. Uh, I think we are <laughs> absolutely evenly decided at 50 50. I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, you are, I mean, we have senior interventional cardiologists here and they are divided 50 50. So I think uh, whatever you decide is right. Yeah. Okay. So I think we'll, uh, since it's 50 50, I think maybe Deepak has the right to. Yeah, to deciding vote in the cat lab. Deciding yeah. vote. <laughs> and so if he says yes, it's leave it alone, we leave it alone. So I, I, I think that's a very pertinent question. And, 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 and that's what I want somebody to answer over here. Is there data to say that such lesion should be tackled or not tackled rather than what we need? I, I don't know. I don't know of any data of Niger, else, Pagari. Uh, does anybody think that we have data to say that a distant lesion should be tackled? I don't. I'm not aware of any data that this is going to increase the risk of stent thrombosis. I think if it was within a short segment after the risk of stent margin, I definitely would be concerned. We may have an issue of recurrent symptomatic ischemia. I that that would then down the track just. I think, um, as Arjun said, if we conclude it, except with COVID or even with DCV, I think we'll get to some of the land draft result and we'll have a long segment of two long steps. I think longer term, I think the risk of target vessel failure possibly be greater than that. That's my impression, again, the opinion. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, uh, the Dr. I mean, Dr. Deepak Davidson from Caritas Hospital. Uh, and I think it was a wonderful case. We did have a lot of discussion on this. And uh, I thank Dr. Ajit Mulasheri, Dr. Christopher Owen for uh, uh, having a nice live case shown to us at IPCI. Thank you all. And I think we Roni will move to our, 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 our next talk. Hello. Thank you very much. Roni sir. Yes. Roni sir, can you? Yes, Deepak, we can hear you and see you. Before we sign off, just wanted to introduce everyone over here. Please. Sir, uh, Thomas, come this side. All of you come this side. Uh, sir, we have uh, Joni Joseph, who is the head of the Department of Cardiology with us. Then Thomas George, he's a senior interventional cardiologist here. Then the entire cath lab crew, Jojo, everything, the Abbott support team. And I should also thank uh, Dr. Chris as well as uh, Sir uh, Ajit Mulashiri, sir, for the for the for being with us and supporting us today and uh, we had a great time thank you once again for uh, involving us in this edition of ipca 2022 thank you so much excellent thank you